Yeah, so there are people who are dogmatic about KJV, even to the point where where one is not saved if they do not read from that version. What are your thoughts? Now, this was an extended question, Brother Luke. They also asked you specifically what what made you a KJV firstist instead of a KJV only. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, I, yeah, I did read the whole question, and it uh, uh, many many people here that you've heard my history as far as uh, my uh, being KJV only for really about twenty five years, uh, and then uh, now I call myself a KJV firstist instead of a KJV onlyist. Um, well, the reason I was KJV only is if you if you look at my oops uh, let me turn my camera on here if you look at uh, my bookshelf behind me here uh, gosh probably about a third of all the books on that shelf are by Dr. Peter Ruckman and if you don't know who Ruckman is um, he, he recently uh, went to be with the Lord but for uh, probably 50 or 60 years, he was quite famous for, um, uh, one, uh, promoting the KJV only position. He was probably the champion or the king of the KJV only us. And uh, all of, I have many of his commentaries, I have about 40 of his books. Uh, I fell into it accidentally. A friend of mine uh, went to prison uh, and uh, he ended up leaving his books to me. I inherited his Ruckman books. So I started reading all of them. And uh, uh, I hadn't been a believer that long, uh, but uh, I was really impressed with Dr. Ruckman's intellect. And, and he really was a, a brilliant person. I'm, I, he must have a really high IQ. He, he was known to have read uh, at least one book a day. I'm just any book, you know, this big, that big, he would read at least a book a day for every day of almost of his life. Um, he read like 5,000 books just while he was in college. Uh, so he was a, a voracious reader. He had a, a really a great ability to recall. Uh, and, uh, but, but uh, so I, I was just so, um, respected his, his intellect and his understanding of the Bible that that I pretty much didn't challenge anything. So the dispensational futurism position on eschatology, uh, the KJV only position, some other things, uh, uh, if Ruckman said it, you know, I just repeated it. And I, I defended all those positions for a long time. But a few years ago, uh, as, as I got more did more and more teaching on YouTube. I started getting questions about some of these things, and uh, the interesting thing is, uh, unless you study both sides of an issue, you're not really qualified to answer questions because I only had understood one point of view. So, because I started taking all these questions from you viewers uh, on these various subjects. Uh, I was forced to dig in and start studying and learning the other point of view. So I had at least had, can give an intelligent answer. I can't refute something until I you know, hear, hear them out. Uh, but as I, as I did these things uh, with the KJV only position and other things, uh, the more I studied it, the more I realized that, wait a second, I, I don't think my position is correct. So I, uh, there's a saying that uh, who but a stubborn fool would hold on to their error once it's been exposed. So if someone tells me I'm wrong and we and I, we talk long enough and they prove it to me, well, I change my position. As I, and that's what I had to do with the KJV only position. But much of what, what changed my mind on it was I started watching a lot of debates on uh, YouTube from the various authorities. One person is an expert on KJV only, another person is an expert arguing against the KJV only position. And as I started listening both both sides, uh, I just saw some some flaws in the KJV only position that made me feel like, wait, it's it's going too far. And we should not take it that far. However, I did learn a lot about the uh, kind of the, the genealogies of the scriptures. The the manuscripts come from. If you look at it as a tree, you have 
the root, the, the roots and the, the trunk of the tree, and then it goes off in all these different branches. And if you trace all those branches back, you can find the various manuscripts that the different translations were based upon. And uh, I do think that the, uh, the manuscripts that were used for the, it's called the receives text, uh, Texas Receptus or the, the majority uh, text. Uh, these, uh, these manuscripts were the ones that I trust. Uh, the argument against it uh, in the KJV is, is that uh, some of the verses Matter of fact, actually thousands of them. <laughs> they say there's either they're either removed entirely, or they are. Um, there's a a, 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 pair, uh, a footnote or a parenthesis that says this portion of the scriptures it was not found in the uh, the oldest manuscripts. Uh, so they they either removed it or question put a doubt in your mind. Well, well, should it be there? Did a scribe possibly just insert it? It wasn't not in the original letter. Uh, so the reason I go with the KJV first is because it has all of it. There's nothing removed. Uh, if we look at, for example, I, th I think it's 1 John 5, 7. Uh, this verse is completely removed from the modern translations. And, and it's uh, there, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. This is the go-to verse to, to uh, define and, and uh, support the Trinity doctrine. Uh, uh, there's, uh, uh, there, there's quite a few verses uh, that if we got into it, uh, you'd see that uh, there's some, some important verses that are removed from the modern translations. So I want to look at the KJV because it has all of it. However, I do not want to be only KJV because I found that it's beneficial for me to look at other translations and commentaries and Sister Renee and Brother Jordan and anybody else who's studying with me to get their thoughts uh, because uh, uh, it's, it's helpful. The more input I get from theologians of the past or co-workers as we study together, the better it is. I, I learn more that way. So I, I think if you take the KJV only position, you are uh, handicapping yourself and limiting yourself. And even though I test the uh, modern translations, I usually test them against the, the KJV because a lot of the modern translations, they have uh, an agenda and that is to add works to salvation. Okay. Um, all right, Renee. Yeah. Um... Well, uh, again, I think I use KJV because it's what I've always used, and I have I trust it because because it is from the Texas Receptus. So uh, I think that those manuscripts uh, were translated word for word. Uh, I think the new translations they have to be changed a certain amount to continue to get copyrights on them, so that they can sell them, make money. So they have to change a large percent, um, and so they'll give you. Uh, like a summary of what they think the verses mean instead of a word for word translation. And then they put their own theology into the text and it confuses people and they'll add words. Like when it says repent, they'll put repent of your sins. Well, God has no sin to repent of. Why do you put of your sins after the word repent when we're told uh, the, the Peter's telling the Jews to repent or change their mind about crucifying the Lord? It had nothing to do with their personal sin. So it, it causes a lot of confusion because then people think salvation is by works of uh, keeping the law because sin is transgression of the law. So there's that. But also, uh, I found some issues with the King James. For instance, they translate five different words, hell, and they don't all mean the same thing. Gehenna and the lake of fire, they're the same place. They're the final lake of fire, the place of judgment when the lost are risen and cast into the lake of fire, but they're risen up bodily. Then you've got Hades or Sheol in the Greek and Hebrew. They're both translated hell also, but they're not the lake of fire. They are the holding place for the dead. They're the intermediate state. That's where the story of Lazarus and the rich man occurred in this intermediate state. Then you've got Tartarus, which is a prison that the fallen angels are bound in and no humans are there. So that's why you get all this weird doctrine around hell, because they've, they've called all these different places the same place. And it's confusing to people. Uh, so that's that I see also they put the word Lucifer 
uh, and Easter in the King James, which were not there. Uh, Lucifer is a Latin word. There's no reason that should be put there. The word that was originally there was LL, which was the name of Satan before he fell, not Lucifer. So uh, there's a few things in the King James I don't like, but I'm so used to using that. I'm King James first, just like you, Luke, because that's the one that works with my brain. I've been reading it so long and I know it's trustworthy. Uh, it's not putting their ideas in. For instance, instead of saying these are they that came out of great tribulation or these are those that came out of great suffering, they put out of the great tribulation, which promotes an end times dispensation of the great tribulation which i don't believe that's accurate those in the vision came out of great tribulation that's all the saints from the dawn of time until the end it's all the saints that went through terrible persecution all through the life of the church not just during the great if you believe in the end times thing so there's issues like that where they put their own theology into the transcript so uh, it can be very confusing, and I don't trust these. Like, I, I don't mind Geneva, the Geneva translation. I think Tyndale did that, right? Uh, I use that sometimes. I had a viewer actually buy that for me. Uh, someone bought me the Young's Literal as well. But what I do is I go with King James first, and because sometimes they'll use words that are very harsh, like damnation, but it really only means condemnation. So I, I look at the, I have to look at the original Greek. What did that mean? Uh, and then I'll check the, the other versions and see what do they think it means. And I, and I kind of get an idea of, of, you know, the correct interpretation. But I always go to King James first only because I know it was translated word for word. However, there are a few places that they translated it. I think could have been better. It could have been uh less confusing if they'd have used different uh words so um i i think it's wrong to be dogmatic to say if you don't read this translation you're not saved again what is that what did i say how can you spot religion it always excludes it excludes religion will always look for a way to exclude you or exclude a group of people from God's love or God's salvation. It's just another way of excluding people. So you can always see the spirit of religion. It's an exclusion spirit. Uh, but the spirit of peace, the spirit of grace, the spirit of Christ is inclusion. Um, and that's how you can determine the difference. So it's wrong to be that dogmatic. There are some people, they only had the NIV. There's people like over in the Middle East that it's illegal to have a Bible. So they only have little pieces of it uh, translated from a, a translation. Maybe we wouldn't even know. You don't think God can use that? Of course he can. I heard about people in prison camps. These Asian guys were being tortured and the general, I'm not being graphic here, used the Bible for toilet paper. And he would be forced to go in there and clean up after him. They would rinse it off and that was all they had. And those little pieces of the Bible kept his spirit strong during this time. They were being persecuted for being Christians. I think it was in North Korea. Uh, in any case, you know, that's all he had. Do you think God's going to be dogmatic? Well, it wasn't King James. I mean, it's just ridiculous how people get. They're, you know, people didn't even have copies of the Bible. It was kept in the synagogue in scroll form. Uh, so I, I think we need to realize that no matter what we have of God's word, that those of us that trust Christ have the Holy Spirit and he will bear witness to truth. He will bear witness to truth. So I think it's, we're supposed to work. Hey, it's hard work to rightly divide, be a workman, rightly dividing the word of truth. Uh, so it is hard work and it's something every Christian should do. Uh, but in regards to salvation, we need to keep these issues out of it because it has nothing to do with salvation at all. Well, I can see that Jordan is got in the starting blocks, ready, ready, really eager to. But let me answer a quick question first, though. Uh, Lisa 
asked, uh, didn't Ruckman say that uh, uh, women, let me see, how did she phrase it? Uh, that uh, women won't be in heaven, I believe. Yeah, there are no women in heaven. Uh, let me see how she phrased it. It's the way the question is asked is not exactly, there will be no women in heaven. Uh, it's not because uh, women don't get to go to heaven. It's just that when they go to heaven, they are changed into men. That's what Ruckman says. And the reason he says that is because he says that we will be like the angels in heaven. And, there, and, and, of, course, and of course, he says that all angels are 33-year-old men. So therefore, when a woman has to be changed into a man in order to, you know, when she goes to heaven, which, I mean, that sounds crazy to all of us, I think. Uh, and as much as I bragged about Ruckman's intellect, you'd think, well, he sounds stupid. But uh, yeah, even, even um, I look at Augustine. Augustine was, is many people, the, the Catholics and, and the Reformed, they all admire and think Augustine was the greatest. And maybe he was brilliant, but I think he was horribly wrong. He was the worst, the worst theologian ever because of the way he taught determinism. A thousand years before Calvin, he taught Calvinism. Calvinism is really Augustinianism, Mechanian uh, um, um, uh, Gnosticism. Uh, determinism, no free will. All these things were from Augustine and the eternal torment in hell and many other things that Augustine really uh, uh, is um, the champion of uh, that led the church in those ways. Um, so I'm saying that a person can be brilliant and yet be horribly wrong. Okay, um, so that's, that's the answer to your question, Lisa. That it's not that women don't get to go to heaven. It's just that when you go there, you're changed into a man according to Ruckman. Okay, Jordan, go ahead. Uh, yeah, the one thing I want to add about the Augustine comment is because this is the argument I hear all the time. Nobody believed in eternal security before John Calvin, which is absolutely absurd. But um, Calvinism did originate back in literally a thousand years beforehand with Augustine. And the thing we have to remember about Augustine's doctrine was he was a Gnostic convert. So just like we see somebody brought it up earlier today that somebody, um, they converted from the Islamic faith to Christianity, but believe they can lose their salvation. When we see this um, conversion from one religious system to another, they still bring elements of their beliefs with them just because they are so indoctrinated in one way so sometimes we don't see a full clarity um so being that augustine did convert from gnosticism it's likely that he didn't get all of his doctrine you know clear during the time of his writings but i alluded to this i don't know this last week about the fact that we have to be careful me personally i was saved using an niv version but now I primarily use the KJV version. And I mentioned the importance of being able to have a word-for-word -word translation because paraphrase translation, such as the message, all you're doing is getting a retelling of one man's interpretation. It's not even the Bible anymore. With your thought-for-thought -thought translations, you're getting all sorts of um, missing text you're also getting false doctrines like the repent for your sins doctrine, the lack of the Trinity. Um, and we have to remember the reason why all these translations are being published are for profit. Everybody wants to have their own Bible version to sell because the Bible is the number one bestseller. And the easier you can make the Bible to read, the more likely our very lazy culture will be to buy it. And then they have all sorts of poor... Um, doctrines as a result. I actually have a list here because I didn't bring it up last time, but just some of the things when we're looking at the New International Version and the New Living Translation, which are your thought for thought translations, uh, not only do we have the missing verses, but we have contradictions with the word for word translations, uh, meanings of the verse changes, it denies Christ as the creator, it underestimates his miracles. Like this list just goes on and on. There's so many things that people don't realize the dangers of a paraphrase or thought for thought translation. 
regardless where you fall, it's like Renee and Luke said, um, I have some slight problems with the KJV2, primarily because of Mark 1616, um, the fact that that's a go-to verse for baptismal regeneration of proof text, and the majority texts do not have that. It's it's likely thought that somebody was just adding their notes. I don't know about that um, because it seems kind of in line with what the rest of Mark was. If you guys go through Mark 15 and 16, you'll see that like just about every verse starts with the word and. So it does seem like it was a continuation of some sort. But um, that's my main thing with the KJV version. But aside from that, um, if you guys do want a more word-for-word -word translation and you're not necessarily adhering strictly to the Textus Receptus, your best versions uh, for word-for-word -word are your NSAB and ESV. Now, this is what I'm going to say about that. You will notice that free grace believers such as us use primarily the KJV. You are going to notice that your Calvinist use primarily ESV. That should show you the significance of how a biblical translation can change your doctrine. Because we both arrive at some of the same conclusions, but yet we're so vastly different and at war with each other all the time, it seems like. So it's important to keep that in mind when choosing your um, version that you read from. Like I said, I normally start with something like the ESV next to my KJV version, next to my interlinear Bible. So I can just go boom, boom, boom to arrive at the conclusion. And then I go to the Lord in prayer. You guys should never be reading anything, especially if you're confused, without going to the Lord in prayer for clarity. And once I arrive at a conclusion, I, I just, I guess I like to confuse myself a little bit, but I like to jump around to other different viewpoints. I'll watch a Calvinist take on the verse, I'll watch a Free Gracers take on the verse. I'll I'll see how different people interpret it. Interpret that. My main reason for doing that is just because I'm an apologist at heart. So I have to know how to defend certain doctrines. But definitely stay clear of paraphrased and thought for thought translations because you're getting more of men's thought and do a lot of research behind the uh, Textus Receptus and why um, people adhere to that in the controversy surrounding and then pray as to however you feel led if you feel that it's um, if you feel led to read a certain version over another but I strongly suggest just having you know ESV KJV and an interlinear Bible so you can just compare okay I think you made a lot of good points uh, I, I would say that uh, reading, uh, getting other men's thoughts uh, is okay. Uh, uh, there's no reason, like, um, whether it's a, a paraphrase or, or I like to look at the amplified, and that's what they're doing is they're amplifying it. They're expounding on the verse of whoever translated it and wrote it. They're giving their interpretation along with the scriptures. And that's what we just did now everything we've talked about today is we are asking people listen to us this is how we see it and uh so we wouldn't tell anybody don't listen to us that's just a man's opinion but test it all by the scriptures and go by uh yeah the word for word translations you need that as as your test test everything against it but then looking at commentaries or paraphrases or anything and listening to any uh theologian uh, I believe that can be very helpful. I want to read the whole question, though, because there's part of it that was uh, uh, the one that wrote the question probably wants us to comment on this also. It says, um, there are many people who are dogmatic about the King James Version 1611 being the only version. They even say that we should burn other Bible versions and even questions one's salvation if they used another Bible version. So um, this is where they really go wrong. If, if any individual says, I'm a KJV only, I say, good for you. I'm not, I'm not gonna argue about with them. I'm not gonna try to change their mind and say, why don't you consider looking at other translations too? I don't care what other people are doing, uh, if, that, if that's what they want. But if they try to impose that on us and say that you, we should burn other translations or that, that uh, if you don't 
Oh, there's a, I saw Anderson actually say uh, to, um, uh, what's that Calvinist uh, guy with the bald head? Uh, um, White, James White. He had, uh, he went over to James White's house and did a, had a conversation with it and, and recorded it. And I thought it was pretty, pretty good, but he was quite insulting there in the end. And he's basically said in the KJV only, he says if a person um, uh, studies long enough and they do not come to the conclusion that they're KJV only, he says they, they never even got saved. Otherwise the Holy Spirit would have convinced them that, that uh, KJV only is the right position. So that's, that's how far, and we know some people here that that they uh, are throw away and burn and tear up uh, other other translations. Uh, I think that whatever Bible a person gets, um, the the Lord can can use that and they can they can benefit from it. Uh, but uh, I just think it's I would never, no matter what the translation is, I would never tear one up or burn one. Yeah. Well, what, what you... what's interesting about that same conversation you just brought up, Brother Luke, is the conversation ended because. Stephen Anderson also brought up the heresy that Jesus Christ burned in hell for three days. And that's what caused an end to that conversation. So Stephen Anderson is just a very confused teacher, in my opinion, who has a lot of blood on his hands. Perfect example of, of the one issue I do have with King James is the fact that they translate hell from all those different words. That's how you get heresies like Anderson teaches that Jesus went to hell. He went to Sheol. That's the place of the dead, the dwelling of the dead and preached his victory. He didn't go down and get tormented by devils because that place doesn't exist. It's a, a temporary holding place. And then the Gehenna and the lake of fire is where the lost are cast into the lake of fire. That's the final judgment. But Sheol and Hades are just the grave or the place of the dead. And so when you translate all four all four or five of those words hell you get the connotation that jesus went to some fiery place and he didn't he went to the grave thou shalt not suffer my soul to decay in hades or yeah won't suffer my soul to see corruption in the grave is what that verse is supposed to say you you know that verse that said you will not suffer my soul to uh, see corruption in the grave in Sheol in Hades it means in the grave or in the place of the dead and it just means that his body is going to come out of the grave risen so uh, that's a r horrible confusion because of that particular translation that is an example of a heresy that comes from a bad translation